Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. One of the central aspects of Jean-Paul Sartre's short essay, Existentialism is a Humanism, that, that many readers find confusing or difficult to wrap their heads around, is this universalism that he insists upon over and over and over again that seems to go in some respects against some of the other things that he's saying about existentialism and us being on our own as individuals, bereft of any sort of pre-given values or arrangement or human nature that we could rely upon. Sartre will tell us that, well, here's how he phrases it. When a person is responsible for themselves, we do not mean only that they are responsible for their own individuality, but that they are responsible for all humanity. That, that's a very big statement there, but it's needed to ground any sort of existentialist ethics that's going to be more than just an individualistic seeking of meaning or value or perhaps even just pleasure. On the other hand, once people start hearing things like that, if they've had a little bit of history of philosophy or a little bit of a background, they immediately see connections with somebody else who spoke in very universal terms, and that is Immanuel Kant with his categorical imperative, the force formulation of which runs that we should always act upon the maxim that we can will at the same time to be a universal law of nature. So we have to say, you know, what if everyone did this, you know, then, you know, you decide whether it's moral or immoral. And that looks very similar to what Sartre is doing. So people hear that and they're like, well, I don't see much of Kant in the rest of this. As a matter of fact, the only philosopher who he actually mentions quite positively in this respect is D Descartes. And how does that fit in? So there's, there's some problems with this that, that seemingly arise and, and generate confusion. There's a lot that he says about this in uh, existentialism as a humanism. And I, I've broken it down into four main points that we should think about. The first is that he insists that when we choose, we choose for all humanity. We don't just choose for ourselves. We are choosing for humanity writ large. We are choosing in a genuinely universal way. So he tells us, as I just brought up, we are in fact responsible not just for ourselves. That is, we not only have to give an account for ourselves, we are responsible for all humanity. We are responsible for everybody who's going to be a human being and everybody who is. And so he goes on a little bit more in this same section and he says, when we say that a person chooses their own self, and I'm changing the language here to make it a little bit more gender neutral and inclusive, we mean that every one of us does likewise, but we also mean that in making this choice, we also choose all humans. We, and it doesn't just say we choose for all humans, we choose all people. There's, there's a vital difference there. He says, in creating the person that we want to be, there is not a single one of our acts which does not at the same time create an image of humanity as we think humanity ought to be. So we choose not just the individual act, we choose to be the kind of person who engages in that act. And he gives lots of examples in the determinate circumstances that I'm in, I could choose to be a trade unionist. <clears throat> Over here, we would say choose to join the union or not, or to be a supporter of the union, or to be a strike breaker. And when I choose that, I'm not just choosing 
for myself and saying, well, in my circumstances, I have to do this, but I, you know, I know that in other circumstances, the right thing to do would be this. We're saying, no, no, this is the, the model of human being that I am endorsing, that I am putting forth in my own actions. If I choose to be a coward, I am choosing that humanity should be cowards or cowardly or coward-like. If I'm choosing to be fair and just, I'm choosing that for humanity. And notice that this is a little bit different than Kant. Kant doesn't think that we can actually choose something bad, something where there's a bit of you know, perversion or corruption or, or something wrong with it, right? We can't choose that consistently. We can only choose that it is an exception for ourselves where we're saying everybody else should behave this way, but I get to be a complete bastard over here, or I get to bend the rules, or I get to do things differently for myself. Sartre is saying when you endorse that you're going to be the kind of person who abuses a child, you are endorsing that that is what humanity ought to look like. And in a certain respect, it's a little bit more, not just open-ended, but dangerous and horrific. Because, you know, think about the people that Sartre was opposing at the time. The Nazis are choosing for all humanity just as much as are the resistance in his time. So he says to choose that to be this or that is to affirm at the same time the value of what it is that we choose. We always choose the good and nothing can be good for us without being good for all. And he says, if Existence precedes essence, and if we grant that we exist and fashion our image at one and the same time, this image is valid for everyone and for our whole age. So our responsibility is much greater than we might have supposed because it extends to all humanity. He's not saying that every choice is actually good uh, in a full sense, but he's saying that this is the pit of freedom that we look into. Nothing actually determines whether I'm going to be a good guy or a bad guy, other than the fact that I choose that. And in doing so, I'm endorsing that for all humanity. So I, I have this incredible um, sort of weight upon my shoulders. He goes on and he talks about, this is a little bit later, the universal, universality of humanity, right? Um, and he says that... What is this universality? It's not that there is actually some sort of pre-given human essence that all of us have. I mean, you could say, well, what about genetics? What about the fact that we all carry basically the same DNA? True. That's not essence as Sartre is talking about here because we are not merely our genetic code or the expression of that in this body. We are what we choose to do with that. So there is no determinism for Sartre that actually compels us to make the choices that we are. There's no human essence pre-given, but he does say that there is something that is universal to humanity. He says, if it's impossible to find in every human being some universal essence, which would be human nature, there does exist a universal human condition. And he says, by condition, the thinkers of today mean more or less the a priori limits which outline human beings' fundamental situation in the universe. Historical situations vary. A person may be born a slave in a pagan society or a feudal lord or a proletarian. What doesn't vary, what is invariant, as we could say, is the necessity for him to exist in the world, to be at work there, to be there in the midst of other people, and to be mortal there. And he says, these are not objective or subjective. They have an objective and a subjective side. Objectively, they're found everywhere and are recognizable everywhere. Subjective because they're lived and are nothing if a human being does not live them. So all of us face certain basic existential conditions, you can say. For example, having to die. For example, having to deal with other people. For example, having to work in some sort of sense, right? Now, what we do with that, that is actually up to us. We decide, as Sartre within, uh, says, within our circumstances. He says that um, 
You know, uh, every configuration, and he gives another set of examples, can be understood by somebody from a different place. Can be understood means that by virtue of a situation they can imagine, they can push themselves to their limits and reconstitute within themselves the configurations of others. Every configuration has a certain universality. So he says, this universality of human being is not given, it is perpetually being made. We, every one of us, is choosing what it means to be a human being in that sense, and not just for ourselves, but for others within these circumstances. How do we respond to circumstances? How do we deal with fundamental existential, you could call them conditions of what it means to be human? So, He goes on, and he he also talks at several points about the possibility of concealing this situation from oneself, saying, oh, I don't decide for everybody. I only decide for myself. Um, If you're going to ask me what if everyone were to do as I do, not a problem. Not everybody does. And there's all sorts of variations on this. It can be the person who thinks of themselves as high IQ, who's like, the mere mortals couldn't understand what I'm choosing to do, right? Uh, Although they're not very bright when it comes to the limitations of IQ tests, right? Or they're willfully blinding themselves to it uh, because they happen to get a high score at one point in time. Um, There's also the criminal who says, well, obviously not everybody's going to do as I do. That's very similar to Kant's wanting to make an exception for oneself. But Sartre says that everybody who's doing something like that, who's saying, oh, not everybody could do or not everybody is doing as I do, is kind of not just missing the point, but willfully obscuring the point because they do bear that same responsibility. They are trying to evade it. There's a certain dishonesty in their comportment within the world that is driving that response on their part. And not surprising because it's difficult to to bear this responsibility, especially if you're acting like a jerk and you realize you're acting like a jerk. And here we come to the fourth point. Sartre says that we can actually pass judgment upon others in the uses that they make of their freedom within the human condition. And you might say, well, how can you do that? You've just said that everybody sort of decides for themselves and they decide for all humanity. Yes, yes. And what that means is being responsible to another, which means they can engage in judgment upon you. Not only can we engage in judgment upon them, everybody else can engage in judgment upon us. They can decide that we did the wrong thing in history and that we were actually a bunch of bastards who lied to ourselves and did awful things to other human beings and that we should have chosen differently. That is a possibility because they are equally deciding what humanity will be. And they do that in that judgment. So judgment can be passed. And Sartre here is going to talk about two different modalities of judgment. He says, first, one can judge, and this is not a judgment of value, but a logical judgment, that certain choices are based on error and others on truth. What does he mean there? Well, if we've defined human situations as a free choice with no excuses and no recourse, then anybody who takes refuge behind excuses Excuses of, oh, passion made me do it. My anger, my love, my despondency, whatever it happens to be. Every person who sets up a determinism, he says, is dishonest. Why? Because they're lying to themselves and lying to others and lying to the world about the fact that they could have chosen differently. They're even lying to themselves about the fact that they've imposed this explanation or excuse out there in the world. And somebody could say, well, how are you going to prevent that, Sart? Why can't somebody choose themselves dishonestly? And he says, well, that's fine. I'm not required to pass moral judgment upon them, but I can define dishonesty as an error. You cannot help considering the truth of the matter. Dishonesty is obviously a falsehood because it belies the complete freedom of involvement. He says, I maintain there's also dishonesty if I choose to state that certain values exist prior to me. It's self-contradictory for me to want them and at the same time state they're imposed upon me. 
What if somebody says to me, what if I want to be dishonest? And Sartre says, knock yourself out, buddy, but you're going to be dishonest. And if you want to hide that from yourself, you're doubly dishonest, and I'll call you on it. So this is not yet getting to a sort of a moral judgment, but there's a prior to that judgment about consistency. It's also possible to pass a moral judgment upon other people and their choices. He says, when I declare that freedom in every concrete circumstance can have no other aim than to want itself, then, you know, this, this becomes the basis of values. That doesn't mean that he wants it in the abstract. It means that the ultimate meaning of the acts of honest people is the quest for freedom as such. Our commitment to certain concrete goals should be furthering that. And if it isn't, then we have to make a decision. Are we going to go along with that? Make a ton of money or being, you know, a communist or a revolutionary or being whatever else it happens to be? Or are we going to say, well, I have to go where freedom you know, requires me to go, whatever that freedom happens to look like? Which am I going to choose for all humanity? And he says, we can, we can judge people for that. So he says that freedom is the definition of human being does not depend on others. But as soon as there's involvement, I'm obliged to want others to have freedom at the same time that I want my own freedom. I can take freedom as my goal only if I take that of others as a goal of well, as goal as well. So when I've recognized that, you know, humans are free beings, I have at the same time recognized that I need to want the freedom of others. So if I'm hiding from myself the fact that I'm actually repressing the freedom of others or depriving them of freedom, then moral judgment can certainly be passed on me. As a matter of fact, moral judgment can be passed on anybody within this scheme, right? But it's passed on the basis that through my actions, through my words, through what it is that I choose, how I prioritize the uses that I make of my freedom, I am sending a message about how humanity ought to be. That message can be called into question by others. We live in a world of heterogeneity, you can say, when it comes to values. So this is what Sartre means by the connection between choice and responsibility and this universalization that takes place that doesn't stem from a human essence, but rather from a human condition and this being the conditions of the exercise of our freedom.